Hi, I'm Patrick Flanagan, uh, RD architect at THX. Basically, I design architecture for signal processing and all the research that goes along with human perception. Uh, why that's relevant for AR is pretty massive, uh, especially for audio. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, a year-long study we did with NYU uh, with Marl, Music and Audio Research Lab. Um, so this is the rendering uh, methodology. So we went, the test flow was, uh, was three phases. Uh, phase one, step externalization, front, back, up, down, and then localization behavior. Phase two, we were looking at uh, attribute tests, like quality assessment. Um, so we had movie or music, and uh, it was a random designation to the assessor. And then phase three was at a, a forced choice to choose least to most preferred. So we have a comprehensive evaluation of bio -render renderers. There were six renderers in total. These are all commercially available as of uh, summer 2017. Uh, the types, there were three HOA renderers, or high order ambisonics, two FOA, first order ambisonics, and one direct HRTF convolution based renderers. The stimuli were uh, broadband drum loops, uh, and all renderers were set to default, so we didn't manipulate the room or we didn't manipulate uh, any sort of reverb settings to, to color the way that they work. And all uh, point sources were placed at one meter distance on the horizontal plane. Um, so we're going to go through an introduction, uh, an overview of the study, go over externalization, front, back, up, down, results, and then there's a lot of slides, so I don't know if we'll get to the other phase. Um, but basically, commercial bio renders, they're everywhere. There's a bunch of companies come up with them. You know, look in the South Bay, there's a few. Um, so we have, you know, an increased interest in, in immersive media. So we have many different software tools that can produce 3D content over headphones. Uh, we developed a multi-phase methodology able to compare the performance and quality attributes of uh, these rendering methodologies. Uh, and we came up with the subjective evaluations and analytical metrics. Uh, then we could observe the variance of performance to see, you know, given a type of stimuli or given a type of content, how um, that would be perceived amongst a group of assessors. Uh, and then if you're designing content, then maybe that will uh, inform you, you know, which renderer to choose or how to um, design your content differently. So, 3D audio rendering vocabulary, for those of you who aren't aware. An audio object is a mono waveform that has uh, metadata associated with it, describes its time and distance and movement through space. That's metadata. Uh, binaural renderers are something that transforms stimuli in a 3D space and adds uh, HRTF cues to um, give you a sense that the sound is coming from outside of your head. Object-based audio is also a mono cue at uh, and it has the ability to move in time and space. And ambisonics is a spherical-based representation of sound. So if you take uh, multiple points across this room, it's basically the amount of samples or amount of microphones inside this space to create and understand the audio information of this entire space. So experimental phases, we're going to talk about externalization and front, back, and up-down confusions. This is phase one. There's a second. Uh, group of slides that we might get to on localization. And then phase two and phase three uh, aren't published yet. They'll be published uh, at a science conference in August. So externalization is azimuth dependent. So depending on where the um, stimuli is along the azimuth, which is the horizontal plane from your, from your eyes, um, the, the amount of externalization that one perceives is, is different. Uh, there's no standardized method for measuring uh, human interaction of externalization. It's a binary paradigm uh, method. There's a discrete scale method. There's a continuous, continuous scale method. Um, factors affecting externalization, uh, plausible or realistic reverberation, head tracking, room divergence. If I play a stimuli in this room and then I put you in a smaller room, it's going to sound weird. 
because you, you're, you have a multimodality mismatch. Uh, and then personalized versus generalized HRTFs, which is everyone has an HRTF. Everyone is, has uh, different ways that they perceive sound off their, their head and their shoulders. And that, that causes a mismatch. And all renderers use generalized, uh, a version of a generalized HRTF. So uh, reversal errors um, occur along the auditory cone of confusion, which is this area over here. And then you have some, some in the median plane. Um, an auditory illusion occurring at a location symmetric to the actual audio event over the frontal court, uh, transverse uh, plane is this way. Uh, factors affecting reversal errors, uh, spectral differences in the HRTF. There's a mismatch between how that audio, uh, particular audio stimuli was coded versus how your, uh, how your ears are actually uh, interpreting that spectral cue. Um, frequency of content and then head tracking obviously causes uh, a better ability to look, uh, localize and have uh, front back uh, reduce reduction. Um, so externalization, this is a, a GUI that we create, created in MATLAB. Um, we had 24 trials per subject. There was six training and there was 18 tests. There were, each render in a, was uh, presented once in the 18 trials. It was a reference uh, stimuli that was placed one time, and then you had uh, three spatialized versions at randomized, randomized azimuth increments. And then you rated basically you know, one through four of where you thought the sound was coming from. So it's inside your head, directly in front of your face, uh, about arm's reach, and then beyond arm's reach. Um, So this is uh, front-back confusions. So this is trying to understand if an, if an auditory event happens in the frontal plane, um, do you perceive that to be behind you or in front of you? Uh, so this, this kind of gets into um, content development. Uh, if you have a center dialogue aspect, you know, is, is the group of people that are listening to your content perceiving it behind them or in front of them? Uh, Up-down confusions are a similar sort of uh, phenomena where something is placed above you and you actually perceive it below you. So the good information is the result. Uh, 79 subjects participated. It was a two-way uh, six by three uh, ANOVA uh, that we ran. We found that the render was significant, the stimulus was significant, and the render times stimulus was significant in this test. So the results for the externalization, um, zero through five, those are the, the six different renderers. We can see that uh, the majority of the renderers got two and a half, uh, you know, an average of two and a half uh, uh, with externalization. Uh, renderer three performed pretty bad uh, compared to the other ones. And then we see that the stimulus were all, were all uh, within range of two and a half uh, on the externalization rating. So then we jump to front back infusions. Again, uh, 69 participants subject, uh, participated. Uh, this is a, a different analytical method. Um, we found the render was significant to, to uh, understanding where the front back infusion was. The stimulus was not, and the renderer time stimulus was not. Uh, and a unique thing about this test is. Uh, or this particular results is number four, which is a, an, a first order ambisonics type uh, renderer performed extremely bad over 50% of the time. A stimulus that was reported in the front appeared behind them. Uh, renderer one performed very well. Here's a different way to look at front back confusions, uh, azimuth dependent. So you see at 40 degrees uh, and 140 degrees of azimuth, uh, you see a tight cluster of uh, correct answers. Uh, the line up top is, again, renderer four, and you see that it performs poorly uh, along a lot of different azimuth locations. So then we move on to up-down confusions. Again, 69 participants, similar uh, analytical method for statistics. Again, we found the render was significant, and stimulus was not, and renderer time stimulus was not. Uh, in this particular uh, answers and findings, we, we see that renderer three performed worse um, in this particular test. 
uh, with over 50% uh, up-down confusions. So we run into uh, reversal rate directional bias. Um, ver reversal rates were broken down um, to try and understand uh, the paradigm between front back to back to front. Um, you, know, you, you can see similar answers. You know, render of one and two are performing quite well. Render of four is performing bad in both fronts. So the main results from, from this particular test, um, and all three tests, uh, render was significantly different from another. So you have s multiple technologies in the industry. They all perform differently amongst a group of people. Uh, we found that renders three and four, FOA, first order ambisonics, were generally weak uh, compared to HOA, which is you know, a higher representation of audio. That seems to be uh, correct. Uh, there was consistent bias for front back over back front reversals. There was no bias found um, for up down. And externalization was the only metric that we found that uh, stimuli and renderer times stimuli had an effect on the ratings. So, conclusions the arbitrary choice of binaural rendering and content curation will have an effect on your content. Um, so, if you're designing immersive experiences in VR or AR, you know, the type of uh, tool that you use to create this content will affect how it's perceived. Uh, and there's uh, gonna be, like I talked about, the sound quality assessment and the preference assessment, and that is going to correlate to this localization and up-down information where we can map the, um, the findings of how someone perceives something as, a, as a, just a general assessment of, of timbre or clarity or naturalness, and then we correlate that with uh, how they performed in other areas of the test. So let's go on to, let's skip this line. So we have time still. So this is a localization test. Um, and Again, these, these are submitted to a science conference uh, for August. <clears throat> so localization um, is much like uh, externalization, except for localization is within a defined location. Um, so we see uh, localization blur is, is, is observed to be in the range of five degrees to 20 degrees. Side regions usually have less accuracy, and that's those, these regions directly next to you. I don't have any more time. <laughs> anyway, uh, both of these papers uh, are about 10 pages long. Um, they're available on the AES, which is the Audio Engineering Society. Uh, you can download them. You can send me an email. You can send THX an email, or you can tweet at THX um, if you have questions about how this stuff works and how it relates to, to audio and, and creating immersive experiences. Um, overall, you know, renderers and, and audio technology is gonna affect uh, consumption of content. And, and the other main thing is that we're still trying to figure out how humans perceive audio. Like, I mean, that's, that's the main goal of, of, of my pursuit is to understand how people hear. So, that's all. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much. So like for every other speaker, if there are uh, questions, we, we have some minutes left. Yes. The names. <laughs> <laughs> the names. The brands? Uh, yes, exactly the question for me. Okay. Yeah. OK. Everyone wants to know the brands. Um, the, the, the concept of this test was not to to uh, allude to which brand is better or not. It was more about how to, how to come up with the methodology and the science behind how people hear. Um, but there's six commercially available renderers that, have, that were out in summer of 2017, and they're, uh, yeah. You, you can pick six, and you can find six, yeah. Right? <laughs> Generally, HOA performs well. 
uh, curious about the uh, type of beacon noise that you ended up using. Um, was it dependent, would you say, on frequency or type of audio cue? Um, and the, the stimuli for, for the test? Yeah, what was the sound effect or beacon? The, the stimuli was broadband drums. So we, we took drum samples. Um, we recorded them at NYU. And um, we, we didn't want to use um, traditional scientific noise, which is pink noise or uh, band past white noise to, to, to do that because you're not going to produce content with that noise ever. Um, so, so we tried to move away from, from traditional scientific noise. And then the, for the music and, and movie portion of the test, um, we used music and movies. So we had jazz, um, jazz recordings, and then we took a, a clip from Star Wars with, with different types of dialogue and action sequences. Thank <laughs> you.